Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's very, very good. So we're going to do uh, Dustin Burrell is our next comic. He's coming up right now. All right, we're going to get him going with Dustin Burrell. <laughs> He's going to Hollywood. Energy has dropped a little bit. It feels like I just walked into my next court date for a DUI or something like that. It was up there, man. It was rising. It was going to the goddamn top and all of a sudden. He, you told a joke about black people not being in Twin Falls? Oh, there's a couple, but they play for the CSI Golden Eagles. Scratch that joke. That one's not worth it. Glenn, you talked about tennis chicks. The reason why it's so exciting with tennis chicks, you already know what they sound like before you have sex with them. <laughs> you also talked about farting a lot. If you're still going to school, Glenn, I'll give you a tip. If you ever fart during a test and it's really loud, turn around to the cheerleader and give her five bucks and say, hey, I didn't know it meant that much to you on that bet. See, I told you, the energy just disappeared. Where's my beer drinker? Give me a holler out. Where's my beer drinker? Where's my pothead? Come on. Where's my Mormon? Where's my paraplegic? I didn't think they were rolling down this way either. So a couple jokes that I saw on the way here, I went into a gas station and I saw this little donation jar sitting there for diabetes. And there's this big pile of stuff in front of this kid. And I didn't see what it was. I guess it was syringe needles. And they were talking about how many times they had to poke themselves. But before I realized it was syringe needles, I thought it was a big fucking pile of candy. And I was like, how cold is that? We're donating to diabetes, but he's got a big pile of candy in front of him that he can't eat. <laughs> then I looked at it again, and I was like, oh, syringes, gotcha. We were driving down here, and we saw a guy that was driving a U-Haul, and it says, any vehicle can pull this trailer for U-Haul. Oh yeah, how about those little smart vehicles? You think that's a pull of U-Haul? You think it's a smart vehicle and it's going to get smashed in between two semis? Smart vehicle? Maybe dumb vehicle. That's just stuff I worked on in 20 minutes on the way down here. Hmm. Yeah, I'm having a fun time too. Let me give you 10 reasons why Brett Favre will not retire in 2010. We got football fans out here. We got Brett Favre fans. Do we have Detroit Lions fans? I'm so sorry if you're a Detroit Lions fan because Brett Favre has been kicking your ass for 20 years. Number one reason Brett Favre will not retire. Now that Kurt Warner has retired, Brett Favre knows that he's the number one running quarterback candidate to sign a commercial contract for Just For Men Hair Dye. Once it was brown, now it's gray. Number two, Brett Favre will not retire because after 2008 when the Lions went 0-16, let me remind you Lions fans that you're 0-18 against Brett Favre on his home field. Brett Favre wants the Lions fans to at least be 0-20 before he retires. Number three, Brett Favre will not retire because he's obligated if he retires he won't have his contract for Wranglers anymore who have never sold a pair of Wrangler jeans in the state of Minnesota or Wisconsin until they signed Brett Favre. Number four, Brett Favre will not retire because he holds the record for one yard touchdown passes but he's selfish. He wants two, three, four, and five yard touchdown passes before he retires. My only question is, who holds the record for 37 yard touchdown passes? Isn't that the important one? Number five. Guess I'll keep going. Number five. Brett Favre will not retire because he doesn't want another quarterback to have more interceptions in the playoffs than him. Nine multi interception playoff games. Seriously, where do they find these records? I just read it off the internet. Number six. Brett Favre does not want to retire because after the NFC Championship game, 
going to New Orleans, he got banned, not banned 15 times. He wants to see if he can come back at the age of 41 to be the first quarterback to throw a touchdown pass in a wheelchair. <laughs> Brett Favre will not retire because he's waiting for Sterling Sharp to come out of retirement so they can get back the passer-TV receiver combination and take it back away from Randy Moss's Tom Brady. Where are you guys at right now? What do you want to hear? <laughs> Wait, yeah, we're back to Wiener Chuck. I'm getting there, dude. I got 17 topics on my list here. Don't worry. Just bear with me. Three more Brett Favre jokes. I'm sorry, okay? I thought he was a funny guy. Number eight, Brett Favre will not retire because he holds the most completion passes for a game on Friday. Seriously? He gets a record for the most completions on a game on Friday? How many quarterbacks have played a game on Friday? Do you think Brett Favre is waiting for Tuesday night football to start so he can add another record to his Hall of Fame resume? <laughs> Number nine, Brett Favre will not retire because he's jealous of Vinny Testaverde being the oldest quarterback to start an NFL game at the age of 45. Brett Favre is 40. Sorry, Lions fans. I guess he'll be 0-24 when he plays Brett at home until he retires. Last but not least, Brett Favre will not retire because he wants to break Cal Ripken Jr.'s record of 2,632 consecutive games. He's at 286. Now, if he really tries to do this, Brett Favre will make the Lions 0 and 185 against Brett Favre at home field, and he'll be 201 years old by the time he accomplishes that record. Golfer? Anyone? We got one. Tiger Woods. He's a cheetah. Oh God, I laughed my ass off when that got sent to me on the internet. Really? He's a cheetah? He's not a lion? So, I'm watching... Anybody have direct TV? Are we all that broke? <laughs> can't afford cable. I can't afford direct TV. I'm watching them on the antenna bunny ears right now. Well, on DirecTV, you have this little button that does a score guide. This is how important Tiger Woods is to the sport of golf. We have the section of baseball scores, basketball scores, hockey scores, tennis scores, and then we have the PGA Masters, and then Tiger Woods has his own section for what you can read about him. It's like he's the top show dominated, dominator of Oprah Winfrey for golf. And I thought it was funny, like, I think it makes so much sense that Tiger Woods is golfing right now because there's been so many times where my married friends would call me and say, I gotta go golf, I gotta go golf right now, dude. I'm like, there's clouds everywhere, there's overcast everywhere, why do you want to golf so bad? We get down to the golf course and I ask him, why do you want to golf so bad? He's all, I just had to get away from my wife. <laughs> I think that's exactly what Tiger Woods is trying to do right now. My last job that I worked before I went to comedy full time was direct TV, ironically. And uh, I got fired because you're supposed to pass full computer assessment test on the on the job training with 80% or above. I got an 88% on the first test and a 78% on the second one. So I got fired over 2%. And I told my boss that he was taking me down to HR and making me give my badge away, ripping it off like it hurt my feelings, you know. And I looked at it and I go, you know, it's really messed up. A 78% is a passing grade at any college university, but at DirecTV, get the fuck out. <laughs> That's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. I also thought um, it was funny because when you go on on-the-job training, they always want you to introduce yourself. And the way you had to introduce yourself is say your name, your favorite smell, and your favorite movie. What I said is, my name is Dustin Burrell, I like the smell of pine, and my favorite movie is Dumb and Dumber. What I wanted to say, but I didn't want to get fired is, my name is Dustin Burrell, my favorite smell is marijuana, and I can't remember my favorite movie. <laughs> You guys are making me work for it, man. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never regret losing that job because my first phone call when I got off on the job training, I had to talk to a guy from India. 
We really have to stereotype people. I mean, the Indian people are the masters of call centers. They know exactly what the hell they're doing. He calls me, and he's having problems with his direct TV screen. It's not showing up right, and it's my first day. I didn't know what the hell I was doing because I was busy writing comedy jokes during training. And he asked me, he's all, Dalton, listen to my problem right now. You're not troubleshooting the trouble problem that I'm having. If you would just go to your technical screen and go into the problem that I'm having with channel 736, you would have this uploaded right now. I'm like, well, maybe you should work here. I'm like, yeah, obviously you know what the hell you're doing more than I do. Maybe you should come down and get an application. I am the head CEO of AIG. I'm like, so you're the problem why everybody's broke right now? <laughs> moving along, moving along. We've gotten a DUI lately because I guarantee it cops are crashing down a lot harder than they used to. Nobody wants to raise their hand, nobody wants to get picked on. It's obvious that I hang out with a lot of alcoholics and drunks when I needed somebody to transport one of my vehicles from Boise to Nampa and I needed an extra driver and I talked to 10 people that day and 7 out of 10 people had a DUI. They couldn't drive one of my vehicles. But I think uh, when you get a DUI, it's kind of like a divorce. They're both similar, similar because usually you get a divorce and a DUI because of the fact of alcohol. I had a friend who's all, yeah, I got a divorce due to alcohol, and I got a DUI due to alcohol. Makes sense. I asked him, I go, well, when you got, I go, when you got the DUI and the divorce, which one was harder to get over? He's all, well, when I got the DUI, the DUI didn't call me a big fat loser for puking on the front porch. So I think the DUI was easier to get over than the divorce because the DUI didn't talk to me while it happened. I almost got a DUI one time up in Boise. I've been, I've had my share of it. I had a DUI at the age of 17 and a DUI for marijuana at the age of 19. Only in Kimberly, Idaho, we did get a DUI for marijuana. I couldn't believe I actually found somebody else that got one that I did. But um, me and my friend were at IHOP and we had a long night of drinking and we came out to the parking lot right, behind, right as I get behind the wheel he decides to urinate on my front tire of my Dodge Dakota. And ironically, six cops pull up to IHOP right as he's urinating on my front fucking tire. And, and the cops come in and they want to talk to me and they, I actually passed the sobriety test. And I was very fortunate that I was talking to the chubby cop because I could tell he was really hungry. He just wanted to go in and get his bacon and eggs, you know? He's all, okay, you're good? He's all, well, I'm not going to let you drive. Just go sit your ass on this bench over here and then get a cab and get out of here. And it's funny because every cop that was coming up, they're stopping and asking the chubby cop what's going on. And they're just laughing and they're laughing and they're laughing. And I wanted to tell them, I'm like, you know, I do stand up comedy, but they're cops. I don't know if that go over so well. He has his fun. <laughs> Whenever a comedian doesn't know what to say or stall time, we just say, you guys are fun. I like you guys. The reserve table rocks over here. You guys ever been to Southernville? Don't you love the bumper sticker that says, where the hell is Featherville? Because usually when I say I've been to Featherville, somebody says, where the hell is Featherville? That is one place you cannot get a DUI at. If you get a DUI in Featherville, you had to been rolling your truck down the mountain while you were getting that DUI. I guarantee you, the time that we got stuck in the mud, that is the only time the cops came up to see if we were all right and told us to camp right there because we were stuck in the mud. The cops told us they were going to pull our Dodge Neon out of the mud the next day, and we had to camp underneath the stars. We were dumb enough not to go out there with a tent. I mean, 20 years old, you know, whatever. And uh, the next day, two hillbillies just come rolling down the mountain with their, with their Chevy Silverado and their Toyota Tacoma. And the guy with the Toyota Tacoma goes, hey, do you need pulled out of the mud? And I'm like, yeah, dude, pull us out. He pulls us out of the mud. And him and his buddy that are in the Silverado and the Tacoma, they're sitting there betting each other. And the one goes, I bet you I can go through that mud that they just got stuck in. The other one goes, I'll bet you a six-pack of Milwaukee Bees. 
tub. It's a tub. It goes. <laughs> gets to his father to mud it. <laughs> Before the guy in the semi Silverado pulls his friend out of the tub and he just goes, Here I come! <laughs> right next to the guy in his coma. We're packing up our neon trying to get the hell out of there because we're thinking these are guys from Deliverance, you know? They just want to hang out there all down, 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 down. Let's get the hell out of here, dude. They're going to be camping with us later if we don't get out of here now. So, they look back at us after they got both of their trucks stuck in the mud and we're going to dodge neon. <laughs> I'm like, what do you want me to do? I go, I can't pull it out. And they're like, well, we'll call our other friend that lives 20 miles away. <laughs> They'll come here, get his cane, and pull us out. I go, well, when you do, hit us up and try to find us. The sad thing was that they did find us later. And they got us so drunk. Me and my buddy got so drunk, we woke up the next day with four people in our tent that we did not know. Three people were cooking us breakfast, calling us Dustin and Tony like they were in our family. And I guarantee you, I was trying to be nice, and I finally looked at him and I go, I do not need to be rude, but who the fuck are you people? <laughs> well, you told us to come over to the campsite last night because you thought we were cool because we pulled you out of the mud. Now we call you by your name on a silver day and you don't like us. I go, the scary thing was, is when me and Tony were fishing in the river raft, every time a jet ski would go by, hey, nothing, hey, Tony. Who's that? Am I going to start putting a freaking tarp around me so I can fish and keep it quiet like it's supposed to be, you know? Hmm. I'll take a few bottles of water and a Bud Light, please. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> I, I would love a uh, Bud Light on my pad and a water bottle, please. I got, I got two hours left up here on stage and I'm getting a little caught now, so, you know, <laughs> not really, guys, I'm not going to put you through that shit, seriously. Let me tell you the story about how I got cut off from alcohol over a comment I put on Facebook. I played darts up in Boise every Monday night, and I've been playing darts in this bar for about seven years, and I thought that me and the bartender had an accurate agreement that I do stand-up comedy and I have a sense of humor. One time I sent her a message and said, hey, I want my pitcher of beer and my shot ready at Monday night darts at 7 o'clock or else, dot, dot, dot. Well, I really messed up because women don't understand sarcasm on text messaging. If you do not put a JK, LOL, or LMAO behind that goddamn sentence, you might as well not talk to them later. Because they're going to think that you are just belittling them and making fun of them in any way. She sends back a message on Facebook saying, well, if that's the way you're going to be, I'll just cut you off from alcohol. I messed up by not saying sorry. I, I said, are you really that cold-hearted of a bitch? No LOL, no JK, no LMAO behind it. My bad. Should I put an OMG or WTF behind it? Maybe that way she'd understand what I'm talking about? So when I sent that message back, she sent me a big blog of just saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I think that was like 20 times in a row before she got to the point of cutting me off from alcohol over Facebook. When I went back to the bar to try to apologize to her and say, do you really think I think that way of you? She's like, you know what, Dustin? Not even my husband has called me a bitch before. I go, well, yeah, obviously, because you cut him off from alcohol. Or you cut him off from sex. Or you cut him off from everything. But you know what? He married you. I didn't. You're my bartender. Give me my damn drink. She wouldn't do it. And from now on, I told her that she's been saving me at least 40 bucks every Monday night from not drinking alcohol. And I go and tip everybody at the snack bar instead. Works for me. She's losing money. Last time I was down here, just sec. We got time. Please don't leave. <laughs> Last time I was down here, I was doing the show at the Bomb Shots Bar. You guys been there? Yeah. You like it? Yeah. yeah. 
Ain't, ain't no thing. It's all right. As soon as I started making fun of Mormons, two guys in missionary outfits walked into the bar. Is that ironic enough? And I had to ask them right away as they walked into the bar, I'm like, if you're trying to choose the right, what are you doing walking up to the bar? You guys are fun. <laughs> Alright, screw Mormons. Who cares? I was born into it. I don't agree with it, but whatever. If you ever flip a bicyclist off up in Boise, make sure he's not the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and make sure that he's not going to catch up with you at the next red light. That really sucks, man. The reason I flipped him off is because he went off the sidewalk into my lane. I had to get into the left lane and swerve around him. And he gets up to my truck, and I don't have power windows, because it's a 1991 Dodge Dakota. I'm trying to reach for the window and roll it up before he gets there. But he gets up and he's like, you took me off? I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> Why? I'm like, well, you're really lucky you're not on the hood of my Dodge Dakota right now, because if I didn't swerve around the lane and dodge you, you would be dead. Fair enough. Fair enough. Moving on. Okay, I got the light. And I had a lot of stuff to talk about, but we can move on. Actually, I'm going to read this little monologue that I am taking on. I know you guys will never believe I'm going to Hollywood after this set. Seriously, they're like, this guy's going to Hollywood, and he's not even off book. So this is a monologue that I wrote. <laughs> that I'm going to compete in Hollywood with, and I'm sorry I'm not off book on it. But they say you can go anywhere in a hover round, and I had to write a monologue that's a TV commercial. A hover round that can really go anywhere. They say you can go anywhere in a hover round, but what happens when you run in the stairs? The MPC, the MPV5 is the best model for the hover round company. But wait until they see the MPV5000. The MPV 5000. That's right, folks. Now you can really go anywhere in a hover round. Stairs, no problem. We now have a hover round that will walk the wheels up and down the stairs anytime with the legs any way you want to go. Want to go to the Grand Canyon, but you're worried about falling off the edge? No worries. With the MPV 5000, we built in a parachute so you know you will be safe anywhere you go in a hover round. So it's breeze and slow speed bringing you down. That's why we put in a turbo boost in just in case the mailbox isn't exciting enough while you're rolling to it at five miles per hour. Safety, we covered that too. Not only will you have a parachute in your MPV 5000, there's also an airbag that will help you soften the blow from any fall that you may experience when you're falling in a hover round. Can't reach the top glass in the cover? That's why we have a jack to take you to a higher ground. The MPV 5000 making your legs more fun and even more accessible for the people that are around you that don't have legs. One more topic and I will get off. I'm sorry I'm putting you through comedy misery right now. I went down to, I went to New York, Cooperstown, New York, and I went to the Howl Cavern. This is a place that is 53 degrees underneath there the whole time. And I'm sitting in the very back of the tour guide, and the guy goes, there's no living life form under here but that. As soon as he says that, as he's continually telling everybody about the tour of the cave and how Indians got savaged by white people, I started going, There's a couple in front of me from New Jersey, and they were getting really irritated, and the wife goes, Honey, I hear fucking crickets. <laughs> and the guy goes, Yeah, I hear too, babe. It's really bullshit when he tells me there's nothing but bats underneath here, and then I hear crickets going through the damn cave. I pay good cold hard cash to pay for this place, and they're telling me that there's more than bats underneath here? He like actually pushed like 20 people out of the way to get up to the tour guy to talk about how upset he was that he got lied to. He's all like, hey buddy, I thought you told me that there was only bats in the knee can. I can't chuck, 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 chuck everywhere. And the tour guy was like, uh, crickets, huh? Okay. So I move into the very center of the crowd, get a little closer to the tour guy, and he's all, over here is glamamite, over here is crystal mite. He even checked underneath a rock because he thought there was crickets in there. And my sister and my dad looked at me and they're like, 
do you do this all the time? I'm like, what did she do if she could do that noise? I'm like, could you imagine how much fun I have with that shit? And then we're finally on the boat going down the river, and I'm sitting right next to this third guy. Then he drops an F-bomb. No way! That's been you the whole time? I'm like, yeah. He's like, where are you from? I'm like, Idaho. He's like, that's right, you are Idaho. I mean, I've never heard that ever in my life, saying I'm from Idaho. Every time I log on to Xbox Live, hey, where are you from? Idaho, 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 Idaho. Some people in St. Louis are just making fun of me like they invented the joke. Seriously, when it comes down to it, Lewis and Clark were snuggling in a tent together, spooning each other. So, Lewis, what do you want to call this place? Well, Clark, how about we just call Idaho? Because that way when everybody says they're from Idaho, everybody that's not from Idaho can say they're the house. I love you, Clark. I love you, Lewis. <laughs> it's not as bad as the fact like saying you're the hoe from Idaho is when you say I'm from Idaho and they're like, you're the first person I met from the Midwest. No, that's Iowa. They got corn. We got potatoes. Do you think there's anybody in the U.S. that's like, we got to go over to Idaho because of potatoes, man. We live in Maine where there's sweet or red potatoes, but I'd rather go to Idaho because they got potatoes. That's what they're known for, right? They don't have the boys to stay from. Them. They just got potatoes. So, the moral of the story to the cricket tour is I've done acting from age 15 to 21, then I did drinking from age 21 to 24, then I did comedy from age 25 to 29. But all that hard work of 14 years of drinking, acting, and trying to tell jokes to people in Twin Falls that don't care about me at the surf club <laughs> has amounted to a $12 an hour seasonal job at the house average, and I can be a tour guide because I can make a goddamn cricket noise. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for bearing with me. I know the energy dropped. I just feel bad for the next guy. <laughs> All right, you guys were fun. Remember, you were fun. <laughs>